Good morning, Calvary Chapel young people. I stole your line. You stole my line. I did. I stole his line. So today we are still coming to you from the great state of Texas, although very shortly I'll be coming to California, but I have to be in quarantine because I've been in Texas. So I won't be able to see anybody, but I'll be nearby, which will feel kind of good. Rudy's not coming with me on this trip, but he'll be coming back as soon as he can. And today, we're going to kind of switch gears. We've been walking through the book of Acts with Paul on his journeys, and we're going to go back to the Old Testament for a while. Uh, we'll come back to, to Acts later. Um, in fact, we'll even visit it a wee bit today, but for the most part, we're headed back to the Old Testament. Can you take us there? Yes. Next six weeks. We are going to step back in the Old Testament, as Julia said, and we're going to study about Moses and the Hebrew nation. In this, in this lesson, we're going to learn about a term called the providence of God. And you're probably saying, what does that mean? What is what? a providence? Well, I'll give you an example. When we talk about God's plan for us, are about walking in God's path, mm -hmm. or seeking God's will, this is being in the providence of God, because God has a plan for each and every one of us in our lives. We don't fully understand it, and most of us, we can't see where it's taking us. But on a gradual path, he leads us in the direction he wants our lives to go. So with that, Julia, would you lead us in prayer? I will do that. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for giving us the opportunity to share your word, to witness how the word can make our lives so much more meaningful, and how the word has in it some advice for us who wish to follow your will for our lives and do things in the way you would have us. So we ask you, Lord, to help us be effective teachers. We ask you, Lord, to help us be effective learners. And most importantly, we ask that you have our, your words speak to us, Lord, in a way that maybe we haven't heard before and that truly touches our heart. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to start today's lesson in the book of Acts, chapter 7. Thought we said we were going back to the Old Testament. We are, yeah. but we have to preference our trip. Ah, first. okay. This is preparing us for our movement to the okay. Exodus. Okay. All right. Acts chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. It says, And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. But when God was but God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. So we see that the patriarchs, which are really uh, Joseph's brothers, sold them into slavery. They had ill will towards his brother. But God had a grand plan of how he was going to build the nation of Israel and how he was going to save the family of Abraham, or Abraham's bloodline. So we see, uh, who is Joseph in this story? Well, Joseph goes way back into the Old Testament. He's one of the 12 sons of Jacob. And Jacob was the son of Isaac. And Isaac was the son of Abraham. So Joseph is in the Abraham's lineage, or in his family. That's another way of saying it. And when we talk about the 12 sons, we're really talking about the 12 tribes of Israel. That's true. That's true. So, you read in the New Testament that Joseph had been sold into slavery. Yep. yep. And who did that? 
His brothers did that because they were envious of him. We did a story several, about two years ago, we talked about the coat of many colors. That's mm -hmm. the same Joseph we're talking about okay. here. So the brothers were envious, but more than the brothers just being envious, we will start seeing how God's plan and direction in Joseph's life starts playing out at a very early stage. Some of it seems very difficult for Joseph, but God is in control of Joseph's life, and great and wonderful things happen. And so we study about Joseph now. We're really going to focus on Moses. But Joseph came before Moses, and Moses' life was directly affected by the things that happened in Joseph's life. So I'm going to pick up the reading, and now we're going to go to the book of Exodus. And I'm going to read from the book of Exodus, verses eight through, uh, chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. And now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and it happen in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us, and so go up out of the land. Hmm. So, why did the uh, new pharaoh of Egypt force the Hebrews into slavery? What was... Well, they, he was afraid. He, he was afraid. They, he thought that because the, the, the Jews, we also call them the Hebrews, um, be, because they had many children, he was afraid that their families would get so big and they would become so many that they would be stronger than his families and his armies. And yeah. he was afraid they were becoming too powerful. You know what's amazing about that? If we think about the Hebrews being becoming such a large nation. There were only 70 people when they started. That's right. That's right. When, when Joseph brought all his family into Egypt, it totaled 70 people. 70 people. And now they're becoming a nation. Yes. So we read on in Exodus, starting in uh, verse 12, it says, But the more they afflicted them the more they multiplied and grew and they were and they were in dread of the children of Israel the king of Egypt spoke to them he, uh, the king of the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives of whom the name of one was Shipra and the other Para and he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. Whoa. What, what were they going to do to the baby boys who were born to the Hebrew people? They were going to throw them in the Nile River and drown them. Well, why? Well, they thought if they could control the male population, then they could control the population of the Hebrews. Oh, because they were afraid that the baby boys would grow up to be fathers of more families. Uh, yep, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And they were just very fearful of the Hebrews. And they had no reason to be because the Hebrews had done nothing but... Uh, work the land and do as they were asked. Okay, so moving on to chapter 2, this is where we start to hear about Moses. I'm going to read 1 through 4. And a man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore him a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him 
daubed it with asphalt and pitch, and put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Wow. So, what did the Hebrew women do with her, with her baby? Well, this, this particular child. Yeah, this, she put him, she made kind of a basket for him out of some plants and some kind of tar-like stuff you can get from plants. And, and she made a basket for him. She put him in the basket and she put it in the river. She put it in by the reeds of the river. Where did the mother put the baby? In the basket? In the basket, in the river. And it said that she put him in the, the reeds of the river. So it, it's unclear as to whether the baby actually floated down or she just put him there and he stayed within the reeds itself. But she definitely put him in a basket and put him in the water and um, was, he was in the Nile River. But we see that his sister was keeping an eye on the basket. That's right. That's right. And what was her name? Uh, the, the sister's name was Miriam. And that sounds like Marion, but it's not. It's Miriam. And you can meet many women today, particularly those of the Jewish faith, that are named Miriam. It's a very common name to this day for Jewish women. It's an old name. It is an old name. Okay. It is an old name. Now we continue on in verse 5. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the river's side, and when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion for him and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. Then his sister, Miriam, said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you for the, from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? Well, how did, how did God use Pharaoh's daughter to protect that baby boy? Well, in a really a, a marvelous way. You know, uh, Pharaoh had said all the male child shall be thrown in the river and drowned. And Moses is, or this baby's mother, put him in the river, but in a secure basket, placed it in a reed, and she must have known where Pharaoh's daughter would come and bathe, since her uh, other, uh, the baby's sister, or uh, her daughter, uh, work for uh, the pharaohs, uh, the princess. Mm. And um, going on in verse 8 through 10, And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him, and the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called him Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. That's what the name in uh, Egyptian meant, Moses. Mm. So what we see here is really brings us in full circle and we come back to this term, the providence of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we see how God works his hand through our lives and through, in this case, Moses' young life and how he placed people and events in a certain order to accomplish the outcome that he wanted. Why Pharaoh wanted to kill all the young children, male children, God had a plan for this one. This brings us back to the, pro uh, to the providence of God. Remember, we said that's a word for the way God has his hand on our lives, always. Always. 
How does this story teach us about God's providence for Moses? Well, if you look at the people that were involved here, you had Moses' mother. You had Pharaoh who said, we're going to kill all the baby boys. And you had his mother who surely heard that news. So she hid him and then put him in a basket in a place where she may well have known the princess might find him. The princess does find him. And the princess has working for her the sister. And the princess wants to keep the baby safe, tells the sister to go find a nurse, a special kind of nurse, one that could nurse a baby, one who, um, who, who was able to feed a baby using her own body. And um, so she said, yes, go get me a nurse who can feed this baby. And she goes and she gets the baby's mother. Birth mother. Birth yeah. mother. Because it is a person who, uh, it's a woman who has given birth to a baby recently that can nurse a baby. And so um, the baby stays with his, um, with his own mother. So we've got Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter, the mother, the baby Moses, and the baby Mo Moses' sister. And all these people make it possible for the baby to stay alive contrary to what Pharaoh planned for him, and to be raised by Pharaoh's own daughter. And we don't know quite yet, but we probably learn that he's going to actually be raised in Pharaoh's home, his castle. But that's for another day. But all of this comes together in a beautiful picture of how God has all kinds of plans for people that we don't even begin to know or think about or or, or understand, really, until perhaps we're actually living them out. So we need to be aware that as we see things happen in our lives, we may not know where it's going to lead. Sure. But we do know one thing, that if we are in God's will, it's going to lead us in a good direction into a good ending. It may be a crooked path to get there, but it will end up where God wants us to be. So we should always be sensitive to God's gentle pushing in our life and follow his directions and stay close and always have God at the center of our life. And trust in him. And trust in him. Absolutely. So yes, this is another exciting story in the Bible that we've heard before, and every time I hear it, I learn something new. Yeah, we always do. It's and that's why we, it works that way. we go back to these stories over and over again. So Mr. Rudy, that brings us to the end of this story. Would you close us in prayer, please? Yes, I will. Thank you. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time that we've had to spend with our young people. Uh, pray your blessings and your protection on them. We know they're going through difficulties, uh, but it's exciting. The church is open. Uh, people are starting to return and able to worship together. And soon all the young people will be able to return and worship together. And we all look forward to that day. But until that happens, Lord, we are so grateful for the opportunities that you put before us that we can share your word with all the young people of our church. So we thank you for that opportunity. Uh, we just praise you and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bye-bye.